Imagine that you were in medical school and were diagnosed with a rare condition that gave you a year to live. But imagine that the condition was so rare that none of your doctors knew how to treat it. So you said, screw it. You're going to do it yourself. You set out on a journey to find your own remedy, even if it meant almost dying five times in the process. Meet Dr. David Fagenbaum, the man who found his own cure at 28 years old. In this episode of the Student Performance Podcast, I interview Dr. Fagenbaum to unlock the secrets of mental toughness, problem solving, and hope that allowed him to accomplish the unthinkable. Let's get into it. Welcome to the Student Performance Podcast, where we dive deep into the science of concepts you never knew had such a big impact on your well being as a student. My mission is not only to transform your life in the classroom, but help you live a more fulfilled life outside of it as well. Dr. David Fagenbaum, we are at your office at the University of Pennsylvania. That's this right. is surreal. Glad to have you here. I know. I know. All Thanks. This time. Thank you so much for doing this. So I gave the people at home a little bit of a intro to you, but I want to talk a little bit more um, about what you've done in addition to chasing your own cure. So first, you're assistant professor of medicine at Penn. You're co-founder of numerous organizations like the CDCN, AMF, and a new nonprofit called Every Cure. That's right. Backed by the Clinton Foundation. You're a New York Times bestselling author. You've been featured on Forbes 30 under 30, and you're only 37 years old. That's right. What? Like it's been busy. It's been busy these last two years. You you've lived I, I just snuck in on that 30 under 30. I was like 29 and yeah. like three quarters. I did just snuck in on that 30 under 30. And I think the the greatest honor of all, you're the first in-person interview of the student performance. Uh, I podcast. was gonna I was gonna bring that up. <laughs> if, you, if you hadn't said it, I was gonna bring it up. Do so you ever look back and you're like I mean I'm sure you do, given your story, but you're just like, holy crap. Like, look at all I've done. You know, it's it's more just like, oh my gosh, it's been so busy. Um, you know, these last uh, 20 years, it's just been like, you know, sort of one thing after another. But it's been things that I've been so passionate about that I could not at the time have imagined doing anything else. It's just been a lot of sprints. Yeah, definitely. Um, all right, so I want to start before you chased your own cure. Um, kind of back to college. Did yep. you always think you were going to be a doctor? Like, was that your? I know you were a quarterback at Georgetown. Right. You were right. you were the beast, and I'm gonna I'm gonna be putting some photos up just nice. to show people how how much of a monster bench pressing machine you were. Um, but yeah, tell me about all that. So growing up, um, as you said, I, I I played quarterback, and I I just wanted to play college football. That was like my dream. You know, one day I want to play college football, and I thought I was always really interested in health and exercise, and I thought medicine could maybe be something that I would be interested in. But it was always football first, mm-hmm. and then I went to Georgetown to play football. We're, we're not known for our football, but went there to play quarterback. And, and shortly after I got there, my mom was diagnosed with brain cancer, and that just like changed everything about my life. I mean, it went from this uh, you know life where I was getting close to achieving this dream, and um, then just to be just totally devastated by by her illness. And and that's really when I said I want to go into medicine. I watched the way my mom battled her cancer. I watched the way that her doctors took care of her, and I just said this is this is what I want to do. Mm-hmm. And so that really focused me. I wanted to go to medicine at that stage as a freshman in college. Yeah, definitely. And having that traumatic event so early yeah. in your college career really could have, in addition to being a student athlete, in addition to being a quarterback where you have a well playbook to memorize, you have all your pre-med classes, how were you able to navigate all of that? Yeah, it, it was really tough. And I think that anyone who's experienced a loss at an early age, um, an illness at an early age, knows just how tough it is to go through that. For me, um, I got through it in, in a couple ways. One is that I knew my mom really loved the idea of me going into medicine and treating patients in her memory. So, so after her passing, I was sort of like energized to do this in her honor and to really you know, try to honor her. And I think the second part is that I learned that actually during really tough times, channeling your your difficult feelings towards something positive can be really therapeutic. And mm-hmm. so um, I was you know, chasing after my pre-med courses. I started this organization, AMF, in my mom's memory for other college students. And I found that the more I was doing and the more active I could be, it actually helped me to, to deal with some of my grief. With the pandemic, with social isolation, with maybe totally. people out there maybe have lost a loved one from COVID, yeah. um, that's really important to understand. 
can you talk a little bit more about AMF? Just explain the organization, because I think a yeah. lot of people are going to be really interested about that. Yeah, my, my mom's name was Anne Marie Fagenbaum, so her initials were AMF. And um, we started this organization in her memory. I actually promised her right before she passed that I would create something in her memory for other college students coping with the illness or death of a loved one, and I would call it AMF. I didn't know what that would stand for. Mm -hmm. um, it, it now stands for Actively Moving Forward. Initially, it stood for Ailing Mothers and Fathers. But yeah, it's basically a support network to get college students together with other college students coping with the illness or death of a loved one for support, so peer-led peer support, but also community service. Because as I was mentioning, the sort of idea of channeling your energy towards a positive outlet when you're really struggling yeah. can be really, really therapeutic. And so we'd go out and we'd raise money for, for various causes and, and to take on things that really meant a lot to us. So that started at Georgetown, correct? Yep. And then you transition it to all over the country, correct? Yeah, it was, it was amazing. So, um, you know, when I started AMF, I really hoped that it would just be me in a room all by myself and that no one else would want to come or need it because, mm -hmm. you know, who, you know, hopefully other people weren't dealing with this. But I learned really quickly there's a huge need at Georgetown. And then I also learned, unfortunately, there's a huge need all around the country. And yeah. so we started our first, our second chapter at UNC, and then pretty quickly it grew all over the place. Yeah, that's amazing. So there's a bunch of pre-meds. Um, listening to this and one of the number one questions I get is how do I start a club I'm really passionate about yeah. uh, you know a specific maybe a social justice maybe it's um, community service project what would you say would be a good first step for someone who wants to build one of these AMFs one day yeah so um, if if you want to if you want to chase after um, a, a challenge you know, like that uh, I would just say number one is really ask yourself, like, what is it that gets you super passionate? What is it that, like, keeps you up at night? What gets you up really early? And then then actually turning that into action is kind of the easy part in the sense that, like, if you have the, if you have the passion, if you have the enthusiasm, then, you know, setting up an organization is actually pretty easy on a college campus. There's there's people that will help you do that. Yeah. But it's really about finding that thing that you're really excited about. And I always say to my, my pre-med friends and colleagues that – it's so important to build that resume to get into medical school, um, but I can tell you it's even more important and even more valuable when those things you're doing to build your resume are the things that get you really excited. So, exactly. so don't start an organization to check that box. Start an organization because you get really excited about that, and then you're going to do really great things with that organization, yeah. which is going to end up helping you with all the things you want to do in your career, um, but don't do it to check the box. Exactly, and I guarantee you during your pen interview or yes. wherever you went, you, you were talking with the exact same passion you were exactly. just now. And, and it was, it was so authentic. And I think that, you know, when people are interviewing and that sort of stuff, they can pick up the passion. And so if it's, I started this group because, you know, I, I wanted to, or I thought that, you know, this is an important need versus like, I started this because I felt yeah. so passionate about it. The interviewers can really feel that. And something also I read in your book too is, you know, you obviously felt alone when your mom passed and yes. that no one was, you know, understood what you were going through other than your immediate family. Yeah. Um, but when you started this organization, you realize that close friends that you never knew had lost a loved one or classmates and that really kind of galvanized the community, right? That's exactly right. I, I mean, I really couldn't believe it. I really, like I said, hoped that it would just be me by myself, but it turned out that all of a sudden my roommates, uh, you know, from our floor mates from down the hall and, and like lab mates were like coming to these meetings and they were going through similar things as me. And I was like, oh my gosh, we've been in college together for a year and you never mentioned that your mom also had brain cancer and passed yeah. away a year ago. I never mentioned that my mom had yeah. brain cancer cancer and so I think you know it's about creating a safe space where you feel like you can share these things and during college age and, and young adulthood sometimes it's really hard to open up about these sorts of things definitely. but I've definitely found like every time I've been afraid to open up and tell people what I was struggling with and, and then I, it's finally happened like usually I've been forced to for some reason mm -hmm. it's been the exact opposite reaction that I was afraid of it's been like this incredible embrace of like oh my gosh we're here for you we want to support you so I really do encourage anyone listening that if you've got something you're really struggling with, whether it's a, a sick parent or something you're personally dealing with, um, the fear of like, oh my gosh, how are people going to handle this or what are they going to think is totally normal. Yeah. But I can tell you in my experience, it's never come to fruition. It's always been the exact opposite and been so supportive. Yeah, it's always tough, you know, opening up about vulnerab vulnerabilities and yes. it's even probably hard to speak about that exactly. kind of stuff, especially in the beginning. Of course. Um, but once you do, you'd be amazed of how many people are going through the exact same thing. We exactly. all feel that we have a unique story or going yes. through something that no one else is going exactly. through. Exactly. I promise you that yes. there's tons of people just in your inner circle yeah. that have similar feelings and have gone through similar things. Um, 
So that's awesome. I thought AMF, in addition to everything you did afterward, was was so cool. Um, so let's fast forward. You graduate, and then you go to Oxford that's right. to get a master's. Yes. Now tell people about this master's and tell people how you got it done. So um, it was a master's in public health focused on cancer prevention. Um, around the time of my mom's passing, just a couple weeks before, I promised her two things. I said, Mom, I'm going to start this organization in your memory, AMF, like we mentioned, and I'm going to dedicate my life to finding treatments for patients like you, and I'm going to chase cures in your memory. And part of that uh, vision after her passing was, I really want to focus on a multi-pronged approach against cancer. So prevent cancer, diagnose, and treat cancer. And so the first step, go to do this master's at Oxford, um, focus on cancer prevention. Um, the only problem is, which I think you know, is that it's a two-year program. I just started dating this girl. I really liked her, Caitlin, and um, I didn't want to be, you know, across the ocean for two years. And so I ended up um, persuading uh, and begging uh, my, my program director to let me just work like a maniac, like all day, every day. Yeah. Yeah. to do a two-year program in about eight months. and um, At Oxford. <laughs> guys, this is not your local community college. This is, this is one of the most pristine universities in the world. It was it was an awesome experience. But, I mean, it, it wasn't like I just winged it. It was I worked so hard. Yeah. Um, and I'm so happy I did because I was able to do this really – wonderful two-year program um, in one year, a little bit less than one year, and able to start medical school right after. So I didn't have to put med school on hold for two years. I was mm -hmm. able to get back to Caitlin. Yeah. And, um, and in hindsight, I'm really happy I did. And again, this was something you were passionate about. This wasn't exactly. like, all right, I need to go to Oxford. Totally. Penn, this is going to look so great for Penn, exactly. so great for Harvard. They're going to they're gonna want me. Right? Totally. Now, this was it was like, I have to do this. Like I promised my mom that I was going to do this. I promised her I'm going to take on cancer. This is the first step in like fulfilling this promise. And um, I was so psyched and, and yeah and that's the thing when when you're that excited about the material like yeah. I just worked all day every day you and, like, can't do a two-year program in eight months if you don't like it or you're doing no. it from alternative motives no <laughs> you can't I like loved it and I was like I'm you know I, I, I just met up with one of my friends from Oxford uh, this past week and uh, and he was talking about how like he's like I anytime I wanted to talk to you or anytime like you know it was let's try to meet up with Dave it was like you were constantly in the department which is you know the Department of Public Health and and yeah I mean, every day of the week, all day, every day, I was in the department, and, and I'm really happy I did it. Did you play football out there, too? I did, yeah. So when so I was when not in the department, <laughs> this actually friend of mine also played football. So so they actually play American football in Oxford, which most people don't know about. But in the same way that, like, our rugby isn't to the same level as it is in other parts of the country, their American football is, is certainly, um, you know, it, it's British American football. But yeah. it was so much fun. I loved it. Yeah, and it was probably a good, you know, Steam release. Totally. Than, totally. You know, it's very different from college football. Yeah. And, and yeah, it's a good steam release from being in the lab, but also uh, very different from like, you know, Division One college football where it's like such a business and so intense. Mm -hmm. Playing college football or playing football at Oxford was just so fun. Yeah. And again, having that team kind of camaraderie, yes. which I think is a big theme to who you are. Totally. Is, you know, you chase your own cure, but as we're going to talk about, it wasn't just you. And it's exactly. never just you never. with AMF with uh, Oxford, with Chasing Your Cure, you always yeah. had a team around you, yeah. and well, that's what you're so great at doing. Um, so now you go to Penn, yeah. right? You go through your first two years of didactics, yeah. right? And that was smooth, relatively smooth. Yeah. Yep. And then what happened after that? So then um, I was on my uh, clinical rotations and I was like finally treating patients and doing all the things that I had really dreamed of doing. And out of nowhere, I just started feeling like more fatigue than I'd ever felt before. I had some abdominal pain, noticed some lumps and bumps in my neck. And um, pretty soon, those early mild symptoms started to really progress. I remember actually even turned to my medical school roommate and said, I think I'm going to die. And yeah. like, I'm, I'm not a dramatic person. That's like yeah. not the kind of thing that I would ever say. But I just knew something horrible was happening. Didn't know what it was. And so um, I ended up taking a medical school exam and then just going right down the hall in the hospital to the emergency department where they started running tests. And my doctor came to my room and said, David, your liver, your kidneys, your bone marrow, your heart, and your lungs are all shutting down. And we don't know why. We have to hospitalize you right away. And over the next couple of days, I was admitted to the intensive care unit. A retinal hemorrhage made me blind in my left eye, fortunately temporarily. Oh, wow. Full vision back. Gained 70 pounds of fluid because my organs weren't working. My liver and kidneys weren't working. And I was so sick that after weeks of this, 
priest came in my room and read me my last rites because my doctors were sure I wasn't going to survive. And that was sort of just the beginning. Yeah. Like that was like just in the first 11 weeks. And then it, it actually even got worse from there. I, I nearly died three times in a six month. And period. they didn't even know what you had, right? Exactly. They thought you had, well, you thought you had lymphoma, right? Exactly. Yeah. I thought I had lymphoma. They didn't know what I had. We're 11 weeks in. I'm having my last rites read to me and we don't even know what it is. It's killing me. Yeah. Um, but you're right. Right around the time of sort of reaching my lowest point when I said goodbye to my family for the second time, that was when um, the right test was done to diagnose idiopathic multicenter calcium disease, a really rare immune system disorder where basically your immune system attacks your vital organs yeah. for an unknown cause. So you ha- you thought you had lymphoma, which had, yep. what, a lifespan of five years, something around that, right? Yeah, five to So ten, you thought, yeah. oh my God, I'm going to get this test done, and they finally get it back, right? And they're like, the nurse, I remember in your book, your nurse is like, oh my God, do you have lymphoma? You have Castleman's disease. Yeah. And I was and, like, yes. And you're first. like, yes. And then you researched it, right? And you found out you actually have a year to live. Exactly. Not five. It was horrible. So it was like, the you know, you talk about the Santa Claus theory of, you know, civilization and yeah. now you're, it's even worse than you thought. Like, what was exactly. that? It, like? it, it was horrible. I mean, one thing that you talk about team and how important team has been for me. My team during that time was my dad and my sisters. They like didn't leave my side. My my dad spent every single. I spent almost six months hospitalized. My dad spent every one of those nights in the hospital room on the pull out bed. Like and he's amazing. an orthopedic surgeon. He's not yeah. a stay at home dad. No, right? no, he's yeah. like yeah. he just stopped everything. Um, yeah. So he was with me every night. My sisters were with me every day. And it was probably the first like hour that no one was with me when that nurse came in. It's like what are the chances that the diagnosis is going to come in when like my family they were all like taking a break or yeah. like getting some food or something first hour in, in months and uh, and like you said I was so happy the nurse was so happy it's not lymphoma this is great and then yeah I went to Wikipedia and I saw these horrible statistics it was like 16% of patients live five years most patients die within one year and it was just terrifying um, and, and as you said it really shook my foundation of how I like thought about the world I had this mm-hmm. like sort of belief that like for every problem out there there must be people working to come up with solutions and like why wouldn't they be why there's wouldn't so they be right doctors, yeah there's, there's so, so many, many researchers, researchers. Yeah. like there has to be right just like figuring out solutions and that like you know when you need it it'll be it'll be delivered to your door this is Santa Claus theory of civilization is, is what I call it um, and all of a sudden I have one of these horrible diseases and there weren't any drugs being developed and it was just so frightening um, and of course that was really just the beginning of, of this journey to chase my cure yeah Exactly. So going into the Chasing My Cure, what was the moment where you're just like, all right, well, no one's working my problem. Yep. You tried all the drugs. You were doing, you called it a carpet bomb of chemotherapy agents. You took yep. a drug that was known to help, you know, certain people with Castleman's, but it kind of helped and then kind of didn't. It was failing. Yep. So what was that moment where you were just like, screw it, you know, that Thanos moon, I'm going to do it myself. <laughs> I'm going to do it That's myself, right. you know. That's right. So, yeah, it was about... 15, so I spent six months in the hospital and then for about 15 months I was healthy and I was back to medical school, um, dating Caitlin, uh, life was, was going well and I, and I really hoped that, that experimental drug would work for me. And then all of a sudden I had a, a deadly relapse again where I spent another month in the hospital and that was so heartbreaking for me because that experimental drug that I hoped would keep me in remission wasn't working. And that's when I learned that nothing else was yeah. being studied. I mean, there was literally nothing else. And so my doctor explained that to me. And he's like, look, like the only drug in development isn't working for you. We're going to keep giving you chemotherapy and we're going to hope that the chemo works. But at a certain point, you're going to hit your lifetime max of chemo where we can't give you anymore and, or it's going to stop working and you're going to die from this disease. Mm-hmm. And, um, I mean, 25 years old like to hear that and to feel that it was just like it's awful yeah um and so uh, there was about two minutes of me feeling just like the worst feeling of my life of like this is horrible looking at my dad my sisters lisa and gina and and caitlin my girlfriend and like they're crying i'm crying and uh and two minutes into it it was like all right I know that there's I know that there's a really low likelihood that I could ever be helpful in finding anything, mm-hmm. um, 
but I also now know that there's no likelihood of my survival if I don't get involved in trying to find something. Yeah. So I'm just going to spend the rest of my life, however long that is, it might be two months, it might be two years, I don't know what it is, but I'm going to spend however much time I have trying to find a drug. And I knew almost immediately that, and I, and I promised my dad and, and, and Caitlin and my sisters that, um, but I knew almost immediately that there was no way I could do it in a traditional way. Mm -hmm. The traditional way of doing research, and I was a third year med student, so I had some exposure to it, um, and, and there was a pen orphan disease center I'd been a part of, was that you need to spend between 10 and 20 years and a billion dollars if you want to develop one drug. Yeah. So like, I didn't have a billion dollars, yeah. <laughs> didn't have 10 to 20 years, so um, it was okay, well then we can't do it this really, the traditional way. Um, let's really dig in on, on how research is done and what, what's like the shortcut or what's like the back door to this yeah. or the side door. And what I learned was two things we could do that r really could accelerate things. One, as you said earlier, is to really build an amazing team and then use the team or the community to determine what's like the highest priority research studies mm -hmm. and then go out and fund those crowdsourced, prioritized study so it's yeah. not just one researcher coming up with an idea but one so one effort is is really figuring out who are the experts and, and what what are the most important studies to do but then in parallel it's realizing that my only way to survive is to find an existing drug something that's already on the pharmacy shelf that I could repurpose and so then the mission became can I figure out what's going wrong in my immune cells and then can I figure out is there a drug at the pharmacy that can reverse whatever I'm figuring out has gone wrong in me so you're on this journey, and like you said, it was an unconventional way. Yeah, so it had to be. If you know, if anyone out there knows medicine, unconventional yeah. in medicine, the bureaucracy of medicine is terrible. Totally. And a lot of the experts in the field, which were you know, few, but there were who've, who've yeah. studied it for way longer than you did. Of course. They didn't necessarily like this, right? No. They told you, don't talk about the research, only talk about your patient story, and that's not yeah. what you wanted to talk about. That's right. So how did you overcome? I, you had no choice, but it's it's not that simple. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of times we ask ourselves, like, who am I to chase yep. my own cure, right? So totally. how were you able to overcome that doubt from the people you really look up to? You know, you're yeah. an awestruck or like, oh, this yeah. is the guy who wrote this review, the only yeah. study out there, you know? Yeah. So how are you kind of able to negate all, of, almost the negativity and focus on, no, this, I know this is the right path? Yeah, I think that, um, so in the book I talk about this sense of feeling like I'm in overtime. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you'll know uh, from, from all the sports that you've played and, and, and is that, in overtime, there's this incredible clarity that comes with like extra time. Like you didn't think you'd have it. You have to really focus. Um, it can be scary, like being in overtime. Like oh my gosh, if I screw up this play, like we're gonna lose the game. But it can also be really clarifying. Like what's really important to me? Like I'm gonna just focus all of my energy on the really important stuff, and I'm gonna sort of let all the other stuff fade away. And that's how I felt ever since I had my last rights read to me. Is like yeah. I have this like extra time. I've got to make the most of it. it. It can be scary at times, but it can also be really clarifying. And and it's really clarifying. Like when your when your goal, and again to use like the sports analogy, you're in overtime, and your goal is in front of you, and yeah. that goal is to find a drug for yourself. And there is someone in the way. Yeah. And like they're telling you you can't do it, and they're or they're even like actively obstructing you. Mm -hmm. Like. You will do anything in your power to get to that goal, right? It's, yeah. it's this incredible focus that comes with being in overtime. And so, you know, one approach is to, like, say, like, I'm not going to work with you. Like, you're obstructionist. Like, you're just, you know, you're either with me or against me. Um, but I think that I had learned enough from my time playing football and also from my time growing and leading AMF that, like, that's not actually how you solve a problem. Like yeah. that, right? You have to figure out, like, how do you bring these people along? How do you help them to see the vision that you're going after? And so I think it was, A, the focus and the clarity of, like, I have limited time left that's going to make me figure out any solution. And then it was, B, the experience from other leadership experiences where I realized, that, like, bulldozing is not actually going to get me there. Um, first off, I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to bulldoze these people. And even yeah. if I wanted to, like, it's not going to be productive. You weren't the beast anymore. Yeah, I wasn't the beast <laughs> anymore. <laughs> the only way I'm going to get there is to figure out how do I bring them along. And yeah. so, I mean, one of the things that I may be most proud of is that, like, those naysayers who, if they're listening to the podcast, they, they'll know who they are. Yeah. Um, those naysayers are like actively part of our army right now. Yeah. Like they are like, we are shoulder to shoulder. We are fighting this disease together in a unified front. Um, and and you know, if you told me that ten years ago, I would have said no way. Yeah. But but really, they've really come around, and and we've made incredible progress that none of us could have made on our own. Right. Yeah. It's, it's only because we worked collectively together. 
Yeah, and I think you, you mentioned is all of your past experience, whether it's at Oxford, whether it's yeah. undergrad, whether it's quarterback of a football team, which yep. is such a huge leadership position and knowing not only your plays, but what everyone yeah, else has to do as well, um, really prepared you and gave you the best shot. You know, yep. even if you thought it was one in a million or, exactly. or whatever, it still prepared you to make this monumentous uh, achievement, right? I totally agree. And I think that, you know, that that is the same for, for all of us in life. You know, we're sort of always building towards that next thing. And we talked at the very beginning about, you know, find that thing you're passionate about. And a lot of times um, I'll talk to, to, to pre-med students and, and, and other folks that are trying to figure out what to do next. And they're sort of in a holding pattern saying like, I haven't found that thing that I'm really passionate about. Yeah. So I'm I think the majority kind of, of people, it's, yeah. it's fair. I think people see you or they see other Steve Jobs and see other people who had just like this tunnel since they were totally. 21 years old or totally. whatever. When the reality is, is you're, you might not find it for a while. You and might not. And, and a lot of it is, is through the work that totally. you find it. To- I agree. But what I will say, and I 100% agree with that, is that when you find that thing, the best thing you could have done when you find the thing you were so passionate about is to have experience chasing after other things before yeah. that. And so what I say to people is that like, try to find that thing that gets you up early in the morning and keeps you up late at night. But if you don't find that exact thing yet, like find the next best thing yeah. that gets you like kind of amped up mm-hmm. and just start chasing after it. Because yeah. by the time, because in the process of chasing after that thing, you're going to pick up those skills. You're going to learn those things. So that way, when you get to like the prime time that you're yeah. like, you're ready for this, right? Yeah. And so I think for me, it was, you know, chasing after AMF and, and doing this other work meant that when like my life was on the line, I could sort of lean on those tools and those skills I learned previously that could help me with it. Yeah, exactly. Another great quote you had in your book that I also had a very similar mindset until kind of life kicks you on the ass is that you have the mindset of if I do the right thing and if I work hard enough, everything will work out. Yep. But it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. That's no, not. You're, you're you totally can work right. harder than everyone else. Yep. You could be more qualified than everyone else. You could have worked as yes. hard as humanly possible, but yep. it's still can't work out sometimes doesn't work out because sometimes the situation is unwinnable exactly you know but all that experience you gain in the process all the hardship the overcoming of hardship you know will help you along the way and you being able to overcome your mom passing who you're really close with who had a really big impact in your life i'm a mama's boy i'm lucky enough to have my mom with me (laughs) Me but very proud of it yeah but that only helps you you know to, to be able to deal with those feelings of despair and like you said to to make a productive, you know, movement towards action, probably really helped with with the chasing my cure. Absolutely, and I, I think you're you're so right. There's there's times that are the things you know are unwinnable. They feel unwinnable. But if you can remember that the things you did to get to that place, though you, they may not have gone how you wanted them to go, they're going to help it the next time. Um, I remember uh, we. We won the state championship my sophomore year of high school in, in football, and we lost my junior and senior year. And I remember senior year in the locker room, um, there was uh, like this sticker on the on the wall at the, the our opponent's um, locker room, and it said, no excuses, no regrets. And I remember getting so frustrated because I was like, I don't have any excuses, I don't have any regrets. Like, I did everything yeah. possible for this, yeah. and we still didn't win. And yeah. so it's like... Yeah, that that happens in life. Like you can have no excuses, no regrets. Like yeah. you literally went all in, you did everything, and you still don't get the outcome. But I'm so happy I put all that time into training because I really do think that a lot of the things from training for football I think really helped me in how I've tried to prepare to you know take on diseases and and build organizations. So yeah, you you don't know when that's going to come in handy, but it's going to come in handy. Yeah, you're just going to have to learn to live with. I did everything yes. I can. I have no regrets, and that's all I can do. A lot of things. Exactly. More things than we think are up to, up to luck yep. and are way out of our control. But as, as long as you totally. say, I did everything humanly possible. I left yes. it out all on the field. That's all you can really ask. And, you know, sometimes when people realize this, this, this sort of feeling that a lot of things are out of our control, that can lead them to stop taking action. Because, yeah. you know, hope is the ultimate inspiration for action, right? If you, if you don't feel like you have any hope, you don't feel like you can get out of your neighborhood, you don't feel like you can get further education, you're not going to take the steps to do it because yeah. you have no hope, right? And so... I think that it's important to recognize that things are totally out of your control, but also know that some things are in your control. And so in my case, like with my disease, it was a 0% chance I would survive if I didn't do anything. And yeah. it was like one in a million if I did do something. Yeah, and so exactly. it's like, it's still not a good chance, Better odds, but yeah. like, you know, it's like dumb and dumber. Like, so you're saying there's a chance, right? Yeah. You know, it's one in a million, um, but it's better than zero. And so I think that, you know, that's, that hopefully is enough to keep you going. Exactly. 
So coming back to like, like I said, you dealing with the feelings of despair with your mom and taking action. And also you said one line that really resonated with me is when you used to work out with football, you used to be on the field puking, yeah. you know, working your, totally. your ass off until totally. you couldn't anymore. And for people out at home, I, you know, my first episode was on working out yep. and I talked a lot about the cognitive benefits and learning faster, yeah. but being able to be in that mindset of being so exhausted yes. and wanting to quit, but res it's really resisting the temptation to quit Completely. and training your mind, callousing your mind, as David Goggins says, yep. um, can help you make action when you are feeling exhausted, exactly. when you feel like there is no hope or there's nothing else to do, it can kind of push you over that edge. I totally agree. I think that there's so many great analogies between, you know, sports training and life. And I, I mean, yeah, the the pain that we would go through when we were training and, you know, given our record at Georgetown, you probably would be surprised to hear how hard, <laughs> how hard we worked. We had a motto that was E equals our effort equals results. And I swear we put in so much more yeah. effort than we got out of results. But that's another, that's for another Quite day. Quite a bit of fraction. Yeah, there, exactly. I mean, there needs to be some sort of like <laughs> yeah. change to this equation. But no, we worked so hard and I really, I really do believe that, um, that that sort of training sort of beyond your limits, it, it teaches you how to go beyond your limits in so many other ways. Cool. So talk a little bit about how you, what like actually happened with Finding yeah. Mike here and how you've used that kind of methodology to what you're doing now. Sure, so um, made that commitment to my family. I would dedicate my life to finding a treatment, built this organization called the Castle Disease Collaborative Network, and then really began to dig into what's going on in my immune system and is there something that I could take, an existing drug that could fix it. And um, uh, made a lot of progress over the course of the year, but then I relapsed again. Um, and, uh, and again, I almost died. I spent about a month in the hospital and during that hospitalization, I was so, so distraught because it was, oh my gosh, I worked so hard for the last year, did everything right, and we didn't get a drug. We, we tried a couple, they didn't work for me. Um, and I'm sitting there you know, looking at my fiance, Caitlin, and just like dreaming about being able to make it to our wedding day, but knowing I, I, didn't, I didn't do enough to, to make it happen. And um, because the doctors didn't think I would survive, I, none of us did. Um, and, and I remember just being so disappointed, but really feeling like, if I could just get one more shot, just give me like, just give me a few more weeks, please, just and just a few more weeks. And so somehow I survived that fifth one, which um, just really didn't think was possible. But lots of chemotherapy helped me survive. And that's really what helped me survive all of my relapses was a combination of seven chemos. But once I got that window, I remember the moment I started like even just waking up, I had my sister next to me. And, and I told her I was too tired. I couldn't even lift the phone um, because I was still so sick. But I, and my sister next to me, we started going through what are all the hospitals that have my blood samples, my lymph node samples, and my medical records, and let's just start calling them. And fortunately, I've been storing blood samples at Penn in the weeks leading up to that relapse. And so she started calling these hospitals. We started getting samples and data sent back to Philadelphia. So once I got out of the hospital a few weeks later, I was like back to Philly, and it was in the lab all day, every day. It was back to what I did at Oxford when I was in the department all day. I was just in the lab all day. It was, you know, back to the training days from Georgetown where it was like, just fight, fight, fight. And, um, and did a bunch of research on my own samples and found out that a part of my immune system called the mTOR pathway, which is a really important communication line for your immune cells to communicate with one another, it was turned on into overdrive. And the greatest thing about that result, and I remember like, being so excited to see it is that there's a drug that already exists that's really good at inhibiting that communication line. So mm -hmm. if it's turned on way too high and that's causing my immune system to go crazy and there's a drug that turns it off, maybe turning that thing off is going to help me. Yeah. Importantly, that drug wasn't made for Castleman's. It was made for kidney transplantation, um, but it, it had never been used for me. But I started testing it on myself and uh, it's been over eight and a half years I've been doing great. I'm in remission on this drug. And now I'm on this mission. I joined the faculty at Penn and I'm on this mission to do this over and over and over again and ask the question, how many drugs are at your neighborhood pharmacy that could be a treatment for you or someone you love? We got to figure out all the all the uses for all drugs. So that's what we do in my center here at Penn. But we've also just launched a nonprofit called Every Cure on the mission to unlock the full potential of each and every drug for each and every disease possible. So whether or not that drug at your pharmacy is approved for one disease or two diseases, we have to figure out all 10 plus diseases that that drug could help. And the best part about it is it's approved, so it's safe. It's safe. Yeah. It's at your neighborhood pharmacy, and the cost to do the work is so limited. So if you if you have a drug and you want to get it approved by the FDA, you have to spend a hundred million dollars or more to get it approved. If you have a drug that's already approved and it's at your pharmacy, all you have to do is to do a limited size study to prove that it works, and you can start patients on it within days, right? Not decades. And so. 
I'm so excited about it. Just to give to you and the listeners sort of a scoping here, there are about 3,000 drugs that are approved by the FDA, and they're approved for only about 3,000 diseases. It's just about one-to-one, but there's 9,000 more diseases that don't have a single approved drug. And so the goal here is to say, of those 3,000 that are approved, let's figure out all the other diseases they can be used for. And there's a lot of precedent here. There's actually a lot of drugs that have been repurposed. So um, some of my favorite examples are a drug called thalidomide that was initially this horrible drug that caused birth defects. It was taken off the market. And then some researchers are trying to figure out why did it cause those birth defects? Well, it turns out that it's this really good anti-cancer drug. And wow. so it went from like this horrible birth defect causing morning sickness drug to being a life-saving cancer drug. Another one's Viagra. We, yeah, all, we, we, all, we all know, <laughs> we all know, you know, Viagra, it's general use. We, what, what, most people don't the, realize what, is that it was initially used for heart, heart disease and it's more recently used for rare pulmonary disease. Wow. And there's actually some promise that it might be useful for Alzheimer's disease. And so, um, um, these are some of my favorite examples where they happen based on serendipity. Like someone just figured out, um, you know, Viagra is a good example where they were surprised by yeah. by a side effect and it turned out to become the primary effect. But there's also examples like my drug, Serolimus, where all it took was a little digging in the lab from a third year medical student, didn't know what the hell he was doing, yeah. to figure out that this drug could be useful for my disease. So we're excited to put, to put the resources, the energy behind really doing this systematically across drugs and diseases. Yeah, amazing. It's, it's just so amazing. You've done so much, and like I said in the beginning, at 37 years old, but it feels like you're only just beginning of the potential of what can be accomplished with every cure. Well, I, I appreciate you saying that, and I think that it, it's something that you and I have talked about before. It's that, you know, my book is called Chasing My Cure, but it's really been chasing our cures from day one. It's, it's not been me. It's been this awesome team, and I'm super excited about what we're building with every cure. Um, we've got a bunch of pharmaceutical companies and data science companies that are donating data, donating assets to help us out. And um, yeah, we're in this like really intense fundraising mode right now. We're in this really intense data acquisition mode. And uh, within a year, I want us to have the world's largest data engine that's matching drugs and diseases 24 seven. So that if you are diagnosed with a horrible disease, you don't need to go into the lab and try to mix together drugs and samples, but that we are doing it around the clock. And we talked about the Santa Claus theory of civilization. We want to create that. We, yeah. we want to be that room of people that's I mean, working around Santa the clock. With all his elves. All their elves all trying to figure out as many <laughs> drug disease combinations as we can. We, I mean, because like you said, that's how I think we all believe medicine is, is that people are working together to figure out this drug for this disease. Unfortunately, there are a bunch of silos that get in the way. There's a bunch of mis, uh, misincentives or disincentives that, that make it so that, that things don't happen the way they should. But we, we want to create that work shop where around the clock we're finding new uses for existing drugs and saving as many lives as possible and I mean you you know this I'm not supposed to be here like yeah. the, the, what I've survived in terms of these five deadly flares um, this the statistical likelihood of that is just so low but but while I'm here I feel like I like owe the universe it's like yeah. if, if I'm alive because of this drug that's on the shelf like maybe I need to be a part of finding out other drugs that are on the shelf for other people that's amazing I love it well, it's been an amazing interview. I loved I learned so much more about you. I thought I knew a lot. <laughs> um, but to end, to end things off, I always like to ask the question, if you can go back in time and give 19-year-old Davy Boy yep. one piece of advice. So before everything happened, before yep. your mom passed away, yes. before, um, before you chased your cure, you were kind of wide-eyed, you know, yes. college student, yep. what would that piece of advice be? Gosh, I think it would be, um, it's going to be tough. These next 20 years are going to be really, really tough. There are going to be some some major lows. Uh, losing my mom was was the the lowest of the low. Um, saying goodbye to my family was was almost as low as that. There are going to be some real lows, Davy Boy, but um, but there are going to be some real highs, yeah. and there are going to be moments where like you just aren't going to believe that like this is real life. We talked about this yeah. earlier. President Clinton's going to call you on the phone and, <laughs> and tell you that he loves your book and that he wants to support you trying to find cures for more people. There, those moments are going to be sprinkled in. There's going to be a lot of lows, a lot of hard work, and then there's going to be the, the, the moments sprinkled in. You're going to get married. You're going to have two incredible yeah. kids. And so just keep fighting. And I, and I hope that that's a message to everyone listening is that like no matter where you are in, in life, there are going to be a lot of lows in front of yeah. you. There's it doesn't matter. Like it doesn't matter what your lows are. Do not exactly. compare your lows to Doctor Fagenbaum's <laughs> lows because they're never going to be that low That's or that true. life That's or death. True. But it doesn't matter. It's still when we're going through stuff. It could be a relationship. It could be yes. you know a, a strained 
a strained whatever. Yes. You know, that still feels like shit. Like, that's the only word that yeah. you can describe it. Like, exactly. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Yes. But like you said, you have to take some sort of action because in what I found is that's the only remedy to get through it. Exactly. You're Everyone listening to this is going to hit some horrible lows. But if you keep pushing, if you keep believing, if you keep working and you turn that hope for a future into action, you're going to get there. Awesome. So I want to end the interview with uh, you reading uh, a newspaper clip nice. um, found in your mom. Do you have it yes, with you? Yes, I got it right here. Oh, it's I, in my I, wallet. I, awesome. I, I keep it with I me everywhere screen, I go. Yeah, I didn't know if you had it memorized or... No, I keep it with me everywhere I go. Although I do have to say that um, I am terrified one day of... Uh, Losing my wallet and then potentially <laughs> losing my prized possession. Here it is. So um, uh, shortly after my mom passed, um, I was uh, cleaning out my mom's wallet with my dad and just taking out uh, you know anything that we thought was important. Um, and I came across this newspaper clipping, and uh, this like I feel like just embodies my mom. So first off, it's on a piece of um, show like, it to the camera. Yeah, it's like it's on a piece of. Um, cereal box like cardboard um uh it's uh laminated with scotch tape um you know really really fancy (laughs) um but it's got this really powerful quote and and so i think it represents my mom in so many ways one it was literally on her she never told me it was like i'm holding something that she used to hold you know 20 years ago which of course is incredibly powerful to me but but also she was this like incredibly understated person who was just like always about like doing good helping people and like never wanting any sort of recognition and so i just feel like this like you know cardboard box newspaper clipping is just like such a representation of her so um it's a pope uh, sorry it's a quote from pope john paul Um, it says he said it best in his address to the youth in camaguay dear young people whether you were believers or not accept the call to be virtuous this means being strong within having a big heart being rich in the highest sentiments bold in the truth courageous in freedom constant in responsibility generous in love invincible in hope and like this just hit me so much because it was like all right this was my mom's it's now a message that like she's passed on to me um and it's all about like you know it says whether you're believers or not like who cares like what your your faith is or is not like Mm -hmm. that's not the issue it's it's what you do with your actions, you know, accept the call to be virtuous, being strong within, doing the right thing, uh, you know, bold in the truth, courageous in freedom, constant in responsibility, generous in love, invincible in hope. And, uh, you know, I, I'm so glad you asked me to pull this out because um, it, it just makes me feel so happy to think about who she was, the kind of person she embodied. And there are chapters of AMF all over the country right now, and no one even knows who my mom is. They yeah. don't know AMF, but her love, her life it continues on. And I just think this is like such a cool embodiment of it. Wow, what a perfect way to, to end the interview. I'm so glad you asked yeah. about that. Well, thank you so much. This, is, this has been incredible. Oh, thanks so much, Brent. 